Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, welcome to all of you who are present here as well as online. So in the next 45, 50 minutes, we'll discuss how I feel the data structure course should be taught. Right? Uh, time permitting, we'll also discuss a few points about the pointers in C. Uh, we had some talk about different way of development uh, by Dr. Venkatesh. I will also be using row, I'll be also using pi, but not the way he did, but it will be procedural way of doing it rather than a functional way of uh, developing it. So we are talking about uh, data structures. So we'll start a few points. I do not use slides. I do everything in front of you. And if there are queries, please free, be free to interrupt me anytime. So what do you think is the data structure? Can I get some sort of input in some way? So what do you think is a data structure? Any of you want to say what it is? So it's a presentation of data, okay. Integer as a data structure. Integer as a data structure. So you do not distinguish between some simple components and those having number of components. Would you distinguish between an integer and an array of integer? Would you consider both as data structures? Yeah, both are data structures. Uh, not precisely. So we do talk about a data structure as having number of components. And they're arranged in some fashion. And how it is arranged could depend upon what you want to achieve at the end of it. A data structure has number of components and each component has a type. Right? The most important aspect of uh, programming is the concept of type. It was there in Fortran to some extent. When COBOL came in, it killed everything. COBOL is an antithesis of a language which ruled the world for over 40 years. Right? So what is the concept of a type and uh, why do we require the type concept? Any inputs for me? I think Dr. Venkatesh, I think at some point mentioned that type is a set. So what is uh, a type? Yeah, you wanted something? What's a type? I think you were saying something. No, no, I was not saying, I was just taking mic. Okay, okay. So what happens when I say, uh, find out 25 plus 34? Find 25 plus 34. What do you get? So 25 plus 34, what do I get? Okay, that's that's a good point. Let's assume they're all integer. Simply add. So what do you get? 25 plus 34. 59. 59. Okay, how did you add? You added the unit digits first, and if there were a carry, you would take to the next step. Is that the only way of adding? And maybe I've seen children, uh, the way they add, right? Keep 25 in the mind or something and keep counting from there onwards, or use fingers or use toes, right? Or you can use tally mark. So set of integer supports addition. Does it say how to add? No, right? So we always distinguish between what and how. So this is one of the most important aspects to understand in programming, distinguish between what and how. So a data type basically has a set of values and a set of operations, right? You might remember the number line that you learn in your school days. We start with natural numbers. We say that one is a natural number. Add one to a natural number, you get another natural number. We cannot 
subtract natural numbers because when we subtract two natural numbers, we will not end up with another natural number, right? We say that a set of natural numbers is not closed for subtraction, right? So we always distinguish between what and how. So given a type, I, I will know what I can do with it, but I do not have to know how it is done. It could be done in different ways. So the most important aspect, the two terms which you should take from this tech lecture are these interface and implementation, right? A data structure is basically a type. So we refer to it as abstract data type. Right? Let's take an example and illustrate this. When you think of a stack, what can you say about it? What do you think is a stack? Yeah? It's a last in first out data structure. So we define a data structure in terms of the operations we can do on it. What can we do on a stack? What operations should push a stack support? Push and pop. Push and pop, right? And maybe you may have functions to check whether the stack is empty. It's likely possible that you may have a function to get the top element without removing the element, right? So maybe you may call it peak. How do we make a stack? Is there a particular way in which we make a stack? Hmm? Can I make a stack in different ways? Yeah. For me, as the user of a stack, should I have to know how the stack is made? No. That is the most important aspect we should understand. To use a stack, I should know what it can support. I do not have to know how it is supported. So basically, a single programmer will not write the whole code. Somebody writes some code, somebody will use it, right? So we talk about server and the client. I'm not talking in terms of networking or anything. Somebody supports the interface and somebody will use the interface. So server supports the interface and the client uses the interface. They do not have to know each other. This is the most important aspect of all, right? I suggest that you may want to look at a very interesting video by Scott Mayers, a very big name in the field of C++. The most important design guideline. Okay, please, this is available on uh, YouTube. You may want to see it. It's an amazing videos. Any, any video of Scott Mayers is very interesting. You may want to see it. So the most important aspect we are trying to repeatedly say is that I use the interface when I'm the client. I support the interface when I'm the server, right? When you go to a restaurant, go to eatery and add some item, maybe paratha or something, somebody makes it and that comes to you. The waiter acts like an interface. You do not know how it is done in the kitchen. Maybe they don't get in the kitchen, they may get from outside and give you. As long as you get it in a reasonable time, you'll be happy. So it's always possible a server could cater to multiple clients. A client can use any server available. That interchangeability is one of the most important aspects. Let's digress a bit and discuss about it. Assume that you are trying to find out a square root of a number. How do you proceed to find the square root? Some language like C, you want to find the square root, what do you do? Yeah, I'm sure you would have used a function to find the square root. There is a function in Python SQRT, so also in C. There's a function called SQRT. You pass a double to it, it gives a double. Do you have to know how the function works 
the use the function. If you're driving a car, you should know steering. You should know how to use the accelerator and the brake. Do you have to know how the car works? Do you have to know how the transmission works? They're not required, right? At that level of driving, you don't require it. If you're a mechanic, maybe you require some other abstraction, but as a driver, you don't require it. If your idea is to get the square root, you don't have to know how the square root works. But assume that the developer of, developer of square root decides to make it more efficient. To find the square root, normally some sort of uh, algorithm is used, which uh, tries to find a better solution each time. It uses some sort of a convergence. Normally the algorithm used is something called the newton raphson method. So it tries to converge to a root. It assumes that one is the root to start with and makes the root better each time. If it's possible for us to say, which is the likely value of root, the convergence could work faster. So do you think it's a good idea that if I give 25 as the number whose root I'm interested in, I also along with give something like four indicating the square root is close to four, hopefully the algorithm works better. Is that a good idea? That I pass two numbers instead of one number. The first number is the root I'm interested in. And the second number is a guess close to the root. Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think the developer of square root should change the library so that it takes two arguments? The answer is a big no. If it is done, all the existing programs will go for a task. None of them will compile anymore. The biggest challenge in software today is not development, it is maintenance. So the interface is sacred, once established, should never be changed. We can add a new function called square root two or something, but we cannot change the interface of the function square root. Okay, uh, in case you know, in the good old days, in two wheelers, we used to apply the brake using the foot lever. When kinetic Honda came in late eighties, the brake lever changed to the hand instead of the foot. My friend says that somebody was driving a kinetic Honda for the first time. A truck came in front of him. He wanted to apply the brake. He was trying to find that using his foot. He couldn't find it. He crashed into the truck and died. That is the problem with change of interface. It can be so terrible. Think of a car, maybe most of you drive car, Think of a car, what if uh, the accelerator becomes the brake and brake becomes the accelerator? Think of how you will drive it. It'd be so difficult, isn't it? So the most important thing in software is interface once established should never be changed, right? So what we'll do here is to show how a course in data structure should be taught, use multiple files, write the interface file, that's a header file in C, its interface concept is across languages. Java has a very interesting concept called interface itself. Write the header file in C, and then the client can write a program to the interface without even knowing what will be the implementation. Then somebody can provide the implementation. We can work together. So we should be able to show in a classroom environment how to develop programs, right? So based on what we have said, we'll try to develop the program right in front of you. I don't bring anything. So what I will do now in the next half an hour develop the header file for stack, develop the program in C for the client using the stack. Maybe we'll take example similar to what Dr. Venkatesh was suggesting. I was trying to show Dr. Neil my possible way of uh, reversing a number. So we'll try to use that example now. We'll write the program without having the server code, then write the server code, write the stack. It will help me in doing it. Maybe we'll do the stack using an array and then show that it works then we'll try to implement the stack using a linked list and show it works. And time permitting, we'll discuss a bit more uh, on pointer concept where people normally have confusion. That's the plan. Let's see how fast I can do it, right? As I said, I don't have anything here. So what I will do now is to create the header file for the stack. I'll call it stack.h, okay? And my stack, is basically a structure and the user should not know anything about it. But unfortunately in C, we don't have any such possibility. 
So what I will do now is to have members within it. I follow a convention. I don't have access control here. So I follow a convention to indicate that these are members which should never be touched because uh, they could be changed, right? Have you come across the word encapsulation? Why do we use encapsulation? Why do we use encapsulation? They yeah, put them together, yes. And maybe along with you may also have access control, right? You may say that you can't change this, you can't do this and so on. Why do we have this? What is the idea of this? These may row function in it. Time being, I'm avoid writing a pi function exactly. And yeah, so I have a function which will push element into the stack. And to make my life easier, I'll just assume that the component being pushed is integer. Okay, so I'm, I'm writing, maybe we can sit together. So this is based on what we said a stack should do. Do you think these signatures are okay? Do you think push should push requires two arguments? Do you think pop requires only one argument, right? So assume that we have this and maybe it'll also have a function to check whether stack is empty. Okay. I cannot explain much about the signatures because of lack of time. I cannot tell you why we are using point uh, using constants here. Okay, so this is my stack. Do you think we understand from this what a stack is supposed to be doing? We have no idea at this point how it will be done, right? Given this, uh, so yeah, is empty. Name was not okay. Thank you. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense to call it e stack, right? We are not checking whether something is a stack, right? Okay, so one more thing we normally do, I, again, I'm not explaining this, but I'm writing it here. So it's a common requirement that when we write a program in C or C++, we should have uh, something like this. So basically to avoid inclusion, the same. Okay. So I'm through this. Now my idea is to use this idea to develop a program to reverse a number, right? So let's uh, try to write the client program now. Uh, just a minute, I don't want this in this. Where do I find this? Okay. Just uh, looking at those- uh, Keep asking. Signatures there, eh? type signatures. Uh, so when you, the push has, returns a void, which means it does something you don't want to know. It does something to the stack, right? But I would expect the pop. Okay, so the pop returns a value that was popped out. Is that, is that the idea? Okay, that's the first question. Is and uh, in C++ library, STL, uh -huh. all the pop functions are uh, white functions. The pop function that I'm writing now, uh, are are, void, are, is it? yeah, they're all white because the uh, pop function, the way I'm writing now is not cohesive. It's doing two things. Yeah, yeah. It's removing that, element, that is, that returning a value also. Yeah. So how do you, how did you decide one of them should be void, the other should not? That was oh, that, okay. Basically, push function pushes something into the into the stack. Correct. We have not taken care of case when that could fail. The that push could fail. push could fail because the stack could become full. Maybe malloc fails if they, if it is a linkless so, implementation of stack. Then uh, I have another question. Ask, okay, ask. Go back to the signature, right? The signature of the function should indicate what all can happen if the normal yeah. sort of legitimate answer, yes. the answer you want and also the exception. Yeah, yeah, actually, again, in the signature, we can discuss a lot. Mm -hmm. If a language supports exceptions, maybe I should be able to say it throws these exceptions. In the language, they see we don't have it. Or I can follow the Microsoft principle, which returns the value as a status all the time. So no matter what it is, in that case, pop function will have to return through a pointer. That's also possible. So we can have variations of signatures here. 
okay. that I normally would discuss in a course, and that is the biggest discussion. Coding is not that important. Right, right. Yeah. Designs, yes. Interface is far more important because it should not change. Okay, again, for lack of time, I'm not going to discuss. Maybe we can take it offline sure. after this. So what we'll do is quickly use this and try to write a program to reverse a number, right? So what do I do now? I'll uh, include a couple of files. Okay. So given a number, I want to reverse it. For example, if the number given is something like uh, 1729, I want to get at the end, when I use the pi concept, I should get 9271. To do this, uh, first thing I will try to do is to put these digits into a stack so that I get the digits in the reverse order. So we'll just try this. Uh, I'm going uh, step by step here. I haven't explained the whole thing so far. So maybe I'll have a function, uh, I call a function to get a number. So incidentally, this number is a very interesting number, a Ramanujan number. So I read the number. And so my idea here is to break into digits and push into stack, okay? So I do not know how stack is going to be made. So I make a stack here. So this is my stack, some name. And before using it, I will call the row function here. This my row function is called init. So I, I will initialize it. And then I will have a loop wherein I try to put the number into digits and put it into the stack. So push each time into the stack, the unit digit, and then divide the number by 10 so that unit digit is removed. Any questions about this? I don't have to know how the stack is made. I'm able to push it. To reverse the number, what I will do here is this. So from the stack, I'll get nine first, I'll just call it D. And then my solution in the beginning, as I call it R, will be zero. When I get nine, I want to make it nine. When I get two, I want to make it two and so on. To do this, I will multiply with the of the digit in the initial value of radix is one, then becomes 10 and 100 and so on. This is the basic idea I would love to use. So initially my radix is one, uh, the reverse number is zero. It'll, stack is not, again, observe that, uh, not know how the stack is going to be made, why the stack is not empty. I will take the reverse number and do this reverse number. I multiply that with 10 and add the unit digit and I get, I get the unit digit by popping from the stack. Okay. And once I come out, I print the reverse number. Okay. So this completes the program and I don't know how the implementation is. And if I done correctly, this should be able to compile. So I do not prefer any ID in the first course. Okay. It didn't, uh, there is a double, uh, there's a double code which has come somewhere here. Okay. okay. It's perfectly all right to have errors. Yeah. What are the function names? Maybe init is fine. This I think is not saved. What are your question? Just a minute. Let's see. Yeah. Is stack that is a mistake that should be is empty, right? Yeah, that's correct. But something else also has gone wrong. Yeah. I made the same mistake second time. Yeah. Yes. 
Thank you. So, so many mistakes. Fine. So, that would have been a difficult mistake to find in slash 10. Others, I think, are fairly okay. So, now that we have done this, we want to implement the stack in one particular way. Okay. okay. And I will start first try to show you using an array implementation. One more thing we can also check there's an interesting command called NM in Unix flavors and also on Minjin W on uh, Windows. That's what I'm using. I can find out which functions are available, which are not you not defined here, but used. So I can make out this here. Okay. So to implement these functions, first thing I should also have a clear idea of what my stack contains. And my stack will contain a key which is an integer and also will contain a, a sorry it's an array we wanted so some array name and so i will fix some size as a maximum size so instead of hard coding it here maybe i can say max and give a value for this either hash define or use constant okay so i have changed the header file that means i have to recompile the client code so now I have to implement these four functions. And one more thing we require to do, uh, if I use an array implementation of a stack, I should know which is the top element. So there are two ways in which I can do. Either I can have a top, which is minus one to start with indicating it is empty, or it could be zero indicating that number of elements is zero. Minus one could be the index. So each variable will have to have some meaning and we should indicate what is the meaning. So this again, I had to. So these conventions are standard C conventions or which are ones? the conventions that you just talked about? Uh, underscore is a, a C convention, uh -huh. which I didn't really use. So if I use this convention like this. No, it, uh, not that, the, the one about uh, the values being negative. And, Zero. Uh, no, it doesn't say anything about C. Anybody, anything is okay. Uh, okay. Index can't be negative in C, unlike yeah. Python, where there's a sort of a wraparound. Yeah. So it depends on the meaning attached for top. Is the top indicating the number of elements in the stack? Then the value should be zero. Okay. Or if it indicate the index to start with, it should be something which is not a valid index. So it can be a minus one. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay. So. So what I will do here is to implement each of these functions. Okay. So I'll assume it is the index, so I'll make it minus one. So that's the meaning I'm attached to, attaching to it. I'm not checking whether there is an overflow. Normal implementation, I may have to do it, but for demonstration purpose, I'm not using it. So I push the element to a position in the array in the stack. The position is given by top and I increment that before putting it. If you're not comfortable, you may write multiple statements to show the same thing. The pop function will return an element from the stack. Again, I'm assuming that the user takes care of whether the stack is empty or otherwise. So this is the position where the top element is. And I subtract the index from there. And to check whether stack is empty or not, I will use comparison. So if I done correct, this should compile. No, it didn't. So okay. 
Okay, there's one error. In line 16. Yeah. So both the programs have been compiled. I must put them together by linking, right? If you know the way C programs work, we do pre-processing, we do compiling, linking, loading, and running. So now I'll use GCC itself for linking also. So it, we are using that as a, a facade and link it. The program that's created is called A. And I now enter the number now and I got minus one, something has gone wrong. So now we are getting into logical error, but it shows how the program is developed. Okay. So can somebody help me now? What could have gone wrong? I got minus one, which is a very unusual answer. Okay. Uh, we take the number, we make the stack, we push each time this, Okay, so radix is one and uh, initial value is zero. It's a place value. No, 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 I know, I know what mistake I made. So I multiply with this and then Change the radix. It's like shifting the number to the left. Okay. Uh, from some the logic is going wrong. Just just a minute. I I get nine and R is zero. So zero plus nine is nine. Next time I come back ninety ninety plus two. Mm. Ninety. Okay, let's just check with a smaller number. So I get nine first. So one plus nine is nine. Next time I get five. So Five into ten plus two is to be fifty two. Just give me a minute, I'll figure out. Oh. R is a reverse number. See, first time, uh, this would be five. No, I don't think that could be wrong. Yeah, so we are done that, right? 
So these are the problems that could happen and I'm always ready to do it like in front of students and I developed AVL trees also like this. Mistakes happen, so we should be able to debug it syntactically as well as logically. Okay, so we are able to do this, right? When we wrote this, we didn't even know how the implementation would happen. Now we wrote the implementation. Now next thing we'll try to do is to change the implementation, but I won't change the code here. I recompile because I'm going to change the header file. If I want to do one more step that I don't even recompile the header file, I have to use something called pimple pointer to implementation. Again, Scott may has expressed that idea. Okay. Remember when you write programs and files, you use only file star and never file because your program should not depend upon the header file, right? So what we'll try to do is this to do this in the next 15 minutes or so. We'll use a, a linked list concept and rewrite the program. To do this, where is this program happening? Fine. So So I'll remove these uh, file which I don't require. So please observe the timestamp of uh, this file. It's uh, 442 and uh, I'll close all these files. Okay. So I will only open these two files. And I will change the stack header. So I want to make a linked list implementation of the stack. So to do this, I won't require this here. And I'll have something called node. Okay. And that will have the key and uh, a field called link, which will point to the next node. And so my stack will only have a pointer to the top of the stack and we'll to again to make our life easier, we'll, we'll do a type diff. Type diff actually defines an interface. Okay. And so I will have head which is a pointer. I'm not going to change any of these at all. These remain exactly same, okay? And now this is complete, therefore I can uh, compile. The client code. I don't, I don't uh, link it, I just compile the client code. It should compile. And we'll observe that the timestamp will never change of this, not change, 1642, it's still that way only. And now I have to implement these three, these four functions here. So how do we go about doing it? So in the beginning, the head of the stack should be null. We are going to use dynamic allocation. So we require standard library and how do we check whether the stack is empty? We check whether the head of the stack is null. Okay. And 
these will be multiple steps. So I'll remove this and start writing it. We get an element to make a new node. So we make a new node, say call it temp by using dynamic allocation. I don't think I'll have time to discuss this even though I would have been very much interested to discuss about dynamic allocation. Okay, so I have created the node. I had to populate the node. So I populate this and I have to put that into the stack. And so how do you do that? I have pointed to stack as they had value of head and that will appear here. And this will take the new value of the temp. So four steps, I am, I'm not writing on the board, maybe you can just check it up. So these four steps will uh, add a node and the popping will be in sort of reverse order of this. Okay. So the last step we do is to remove the last node. Okay. So Then before that, I'll create a local field called element. And to this, I'll copy from temp. I can have this in the beginning. I can copy from temp the key. Then I must change the head of the list to point to the node below. So this is the reverse of this operation. And at the end, I return key, return element. Okay. So hope this is uh, okay. So let me just check once. So if things are fine, uh, I should be able to compile this. Link underscore is the name, okay. Because there is no compiler support for access control. I'm doing it through convention. And now let's check up whether the time of this file has changed. It is still 1642. And I link the two. And I run the program, I give the same number and I get the same thing now. So I don't know how much you're able to make out. The most important thing I'm trying to tell you is that we have encapsulation, we have access control in over languages. It is not for security, it's basically for maintenance. Over a period, things will change. When something changes, it'll affect everything else which depends on it. So what we are using here is a concept called dependency inversion. The client depends on the interface. The server depends on the interface. They do not depend on each other. When I change the client, I don't have to change the server. When I change the server, I don't have to change the client. So a data structure is basically an interface is an ADT. That's what we are trying to talk about. Anything you want to say? Okay. This is the main thing I wanted to talk about and we still have around seven, eight minutes. Okay. So maybe we can uh, discuss some 
points about pointers. Uh, we are using malloc here, right? So let's let's go back. So I take a risk of doing everything in front of my participants, and I yeah I always make mistakes. Uh, not deliberately, but it happens because of my thinking, right? I am thinking in too many different directions, so it becomes difficult to always get everything right first step. That's what Dr. Viraj keeps telling me that he can't take the risk, but I always take the risk. It's okay, okay. So let's write some code, nothing really important per se. Uh, if I have a pointer in my code and I will say, allocate some space. Okay, I may use it here and I say free. What argument should I pass for free? I'm allocating space. Now I want to deallocate. What shall I pass for free? What should be the argument for free? Can I just pass the pointer? Should I also indicate along with it? How many bytes were allocated? A pointer is a dumb thing, right? It's just some number. Not an integer in mathematical sense, but it's a number. How will it know how many bytes are in? Or P cannot have anything. P, that, that's what I'm saying. At the implementation level, everything is pared down. The point will just have a single value internally. The type system is only at compile time. At runtime, the model doesn't support anything. How about in something like this, when I have an array of numbers allocated. Should I say free P or say something else? Hmm? Or in the same case, what could happen if I were to say free P plus one? We can do arithmetic with pointers, right? Point arithmetic is the bane of C and C++. All other languages do have pointers, but they do not support point arithmetic. What could happen here? Okay, I'll throw, I'll throw a few questions. I, I will not be able to answer them. I don't want to answer them. So you, you have my email ID, so in case you want, you can contact me back. Uh, what could happen in this case? Uh, I call folk. Right? Those of you who studied computer science and operating system would know about it. For creates a new process, right? I have uh, a variable a, and for returns a process ID of the child in the parent and uh, in the child returns zero. So I could say something like if p ID do something, otherwise do something else. And if I hear print. the address of A, and also here I print the address of A, what will I get? Will they be same or different? Okay. And what is the difference between garbage dangling pointer or the difference between the two and when does dereferencing a dangling pointer fail? 99% time it doesn't fail. Why is that it doesn't fail at all? A few questions again for you to think about. What happens if I say malloc 
one byte. Is it possible or not possible? In case you come from a business family, maybe you have a grocery shop, can I go to the shop and ask, give me 10 grains of sugar, will you sell it? I want 10 grains of sugar, I'm a poor teacher, so I can't pay you today, I'll pay after a month. Each day I'll come to your shop and ask for 15 grains of sugar or 12 grains of sugar and so on. Would you sell so many grains of sugar? Okay, think about this. I think it's time for me to say stop. Okay, stop at this. And what I've shown you in this is the way we develop software. The most important thing is the development of the interface. Once the interface is developed, we can separate across and develop programs. We have done these experiments in the industry a number of times to see whether people are comfortable. Within half an hour, the people come back and say, no, we are not still sure of the interface. Again, we have to discuss. So it's, it's very interesting. And we also tried combining groups. One group will make the interface, other one will develop. We interchange and try to put them together. Many times it doesn't work, it fails. So, the, so again, in case you're teaching data structures, do teach this way, develop separately. And especially if you have project teams, make them mix things together and see if they work, right? Okay, that's about it, thank you. All these slides I'll share with uh, Dr. Neil and maybe you can take from her. Yeah. Yes, sir. So since C is known to be such a unsafe language. Okay. What precautions would you advise for someone in spite of that trying to write C programs uh, in terms of how to define, um, like what did you call them? Type abbreviations, right? And other things. So what are the, I mean, what are the things that one should, are there practices that sort of steer clear of that problem? At least I know it's not possible to do that all the times, but some advice to people who write C programs because C has a fairly notorious type system. Yeah. Every language has a philosophy. Mm -hmm. Every language follows a philosophy. Both C and C++ give more importance for efficiency than anything else. Python gives a lot of importance for flexibility, right? So in case of Python, type is a runtime mechanism. Type is carried over to runtime. Checking happens if necessary at runtime only, right? And, and also Python supports a very unusual way of interchanging the interface, duct typing. If a class A can do the work, and if class B can also do the same thing, I can interchangeably change from A to B. I, we can never do such things in languages like C and C++, which are totally compiled, where type is a compiled mechanism. There is nothing of type at runtime at all. So resource usage wise, C and C++ are very good. So in case you want to have some sort of dynamic checking, it has to be built in by the programmer. So the programmer has a choice. He can write programs which do not have to carry to the safety or he can check the safety himself. But in C it's very limited because he can at the most he can show signals. That's possible, it's, it's pretty limited. In C++ you can have exception handling. But as a matter of fact, in case you remember the good old days of 2000, when we have those uh, Nokia mobiles, they supported a C++ version, which did not support exceptions. It instead had something called D-traps. Okay. Even, though, even though C++ does not support having uh, subsets, but they did that. So if safety is more important, efficiency is not, maybe you want to choose a language like Python or Java. But if efficiency is more important, you will have to choose C++ today. Yeah, I think today the choice is not really, um, I mean, you don't have to have made that choice. There are many, many companies which have rejected Python. Mm -hmm. And there are companies which stand by C++. Uh, C++ design is an amazing concept. In case any of you use C++, I was just taking the question offline, right? 
time? Yeah. Okay. No, no, it's, it's completely Yeah, so I, I can take the question offline. As I said about cohesion and allocating a single object on the heap, or allocating an array of objects heap have different signatures because when you allocate an object on the heap, you can optimize away the bookkeeping where you can't do it for an array of objects. It's just amazing. And we have overloading of functions based on type and those types are never used. It's only a holder at the compile time to support different ways we can operate at the compile time level itself. Okay, maybe we'll take it offline. I think Neil Dara will have trouble. Malloc is a very low level function which requires the number of bytes. It requires number of bytes to be allocated. It doesn't know anything about type at runtime. Mm -hmm. And malloc, apart from allocation of space, has a bookkeeping information which knows how many bytes are allocated. There is a mapping between the pointer value given by malloc and the location where that value is stored. That's what free is using, right? And again, the pointer value cannot be changed by calling a function unless you pass a pointer to that itself, right? Parameter passing is by value in C. Right. Makes sense. Um, then are there any other quick questions or comments, uh, either from the online or offline audience? Do you have something to say about C++? <laughs> um, take that discussion offline. Um, all right, so uh, let's thank Kumar again for a very nice interactive session. Um, so there should be coffee and snacks outside for the in-person audience. So let's, um, let's meet outside. Uh, for the online audience, thank you so much for joining in. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And I'll keep in touch about logistics of uh, uh, certificates and materials being uploaded on the website. So let's keep in touch in the WhatsApp group. Until next time, thanks so much and uh, bye for now.